feeling like a shark in a shrimp tank. Big fish, small pond in the shrimp tank. Welcome to the Shrimp Tank Charleston Show. I'm your host, Eric Elkins. The Shrimp Tank Charleston is a nationally syndicated podcast that can be heard and watched on YouTube, Google, Apple, and Spotify. You can also tune in and, t- and subscribe to our shows on our website. Go to www.doubleellc.com. Spell that out, D-O-U-B-L-E-E-L-L-C.com for past shows and great information. And we've been having some really, really good shows recently, and I'm excited about what we have today because this is a super cool individual as well as a very extraordinary company that I have uh, grown fond of, and I wanted to have Paul in to talk about the Chief Outsiders. But let me just give you a quick little bio of our guest today, Paul Sparrow. He's the managing partner at Chief Outsiders, which you're going to hear all about what this company can do and has been doing. It's the Inc. 5000 company. It's just blowing up. But uh, going back to Paul, Paul, you ran sales organizations at Johnson & Johnson, WebMD, uh, Benefit Focus. You've worked for Fortune 50 uh, companies throughout uh, your life and career, and and you've been recognized as a chief marketing officer of the year. There's just so many things that, Paul, you've accomplished. I don't have time to go through all this, but it's very impressive. So congratulations, number one. Number two, thank you for being on the show. I really appreciate it. And without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Paul Sparrow is in the Double E Studios today talking about how to grow your company, how to get through all this kind of crazy stuff that we as entrepreneurs and leaders all around have to deal with. So thanks for coming on the show. That's my pleasure, Eric. Thanks for having me. Um, So let's get a little bit of background, info, a little history. I know you grew up in the beautiful city of Macon, Georgia, (laughs) <laughs> and I know Macon because that's a big town. My parents are from Tifton. Oh yeah. And Alma. My dad was from Alma. My mm-hmm. mom's from Tifton. Mm-hmm. So Macon was kind of the big time city. It was that <laughs> in Albany. <clears throat> Albany, if you say it properly. Oh, it's Albany. Albany. Okay, I did not know <clears throat> that. Yeah. So, tell me a little bit about that early childhood life. What was that like? Sure. I was actually born in Mobile, Alabama, and uh, we lived, lived there till I was 10. My mom grew up in Alabama. My dad was from Macon, Georgia. <clears throat> so we moved to Macon when I was 10 years old, and Macon became my hometown. I have two older brothers and a younger sister. Um, both of my older brothers are Alabama fans. They were very happy Saturday night. I grew up a Georgia fan. I was mm. unhappy Saturday night. But Macon is a, uh, it's funny that you talk about Macon like it's a big city because when I talk about Macon, and I'll say, you've probably been through Macon. You probably stopped on your way from Atlanta to Florida and got gas and kept going. <laughs> no, for me, it's, it actually was a big town. I don't know what's bigger. Is Tifton bigger now that, or Macon? What's bigger? I think Macon's probably bigger. I'm not sure. Macon hasn't grown a lot in the last 20 or 30 years. It's about the same size it always was. Yeah, I totally know Macon. And I had an aunt and uncle who used to live in Baxley. Oh, yeah. I mean, I know all these. fit, And then you had Fitzgerald and you had all these little towns in between. So, um, so did you grow up in, in – in, to give folks kind of a little vision, even though you can watch this episode on YouTube – with money, no money, middle class, upper class, what did that look like? Middle class. We lived in North Macon, which we all thought was the desirable part of Macon, but we were middle class. My dad was a real estate broker. Um, typically, it was him, and once in a while, he'd have one or two salespeople working for him. He did property management and um, you know sold some real estate, but... My mom was a typical mom of the 50s and 60s. She stayed home and was a home taker, home home keeper, I guess. Um, they used to call that housewife, but now that's politically incorrect. But that's the way she would have referred to herself. 
But, uh, yeah, I mean, we definitely were not a family of means. Uh, we didn't starve to death. I mean, Daddy took care of the family. But uh, I, when I turned 16, I didn't get a car. My friends, a lot of my friends got cars. I didn't. I didn't. You know, I ended up working hard and earning my own money and buying my own car myself. Which probably kind of paved the road for you on kind of that work ethic. For sure. What it meant. For sure. And so you you go on to Mercer, yeah, which is in Macon. It, it, it is, yeah, yep. A college uh, out in Macon. Some decent sports, I thought Mercer has had. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mercer's but, Division One. Uh, when I was there, uh, there were only about thirty three hundred students. They're about ten thousand now. They didn't have football when I was there. Now they have football. You know, Mercer goes and plays Alabama and you know, schools of that type and gets paid a million and a half dollars to get their brains beat in. That's what they do now. Hey, I'll take it. Yeah, all day, all day. It's like fighting Mike Tyson and getting (laughs) paid for it. Yeah, yeah, you'd do that. You might do that for a million and a half. Were were you a good student? Were you academically very good? I wouldn't, no, I wouldn't describe myself as a good student, but I also wouldn't describe myself as a bad student. I, I... Hey man, it's it's all about succeeding. Uh, I've never failed a class in my life in anything. Did I make a few D's? Yeah. Did I make some A's? Absolutely. But you know, I I I wasn't uh, you know uh, wearing the fancy tassels when I graduated. It was just good to graduate, and that was fine by me. And so, when you get out of school, what's the direction that you wanted to go into? And was that the same direction you ended up taking? Yeah, great question. Really great question. And um, I did not take what I wanted to do. What I wanted to do was be a writer. And so when I graduated from Mercer, I majored in English and I minored in art history. And um, my plan was to go to the University of Georgia, great journalism school. And I, be- I was a governor's intern. When I graduated, I became a governor's intern. And most governor's interns in the state of Georgia get sent to Atlanta. Guess where they sent me? Athens. I was, I was the public relations and promotions intern for the Georgia State Parks. And they sent me to Athens. So I spent, I had about three or four months, uh, which carried a stipend after I'd graduated. And... Um, they loved me. They got additional money and asked me to stay for a couple of more months. So I was probably in Athens about six months. And I went to school and talked to all the professors. And, you know, and I realized, man, I'm going to get in debt because I already had debt from Mercer. Uh, my dad paid for some of my education, but I took out loans for quite a bit of my education. And I just went, man, I, you know, I'd rather get ahead than get behind. So I made the decision not to go to Georgia. I got accepted, but I made the decision not to. And I went back home, and I worked for my dad for a very short time. My dad said, I've got a business, and it's all established, and, you know, you're the only one with the sense to take it on. Your your brothers and your sister wouldn't wouldn't fit. Please try the business. So I said, all right, I'll give it a year. I love my dad, but we didn't work well together. Yeah, it's and hard. It, 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 it's tough. And uh, and I didn't like real estate either, Eric. It just wasn't my bag. And um, I ended up getting recruited by my alma mater, by Mercer, to be a college recruiter. And I did that for three and a half years. Frankly, probably the best job I've ever had. Paid the least. They hired me for the whopping sum of $12,000 a year. and I thought that was pretty good. And I traveled a lot. Talked to parents and kids and high school counselors about going to Mercer, and I was the walking, talking billboard. I had been to Mercer, so I knew all about it. Uh, it, it was a great job, a lot of fun. But that moved me from, I'm going to write the next great American novel, to, hey, I, my dad's been telling me all my life that I'm a born salesman. I'm pretty good at promotions and, and sales. And after three and a half years of, of Mercer, uh, I ended up landing a job with Johnson & Johnson and became a pharmaceutical sales uh, representative. How long were you with those guys? Ten years. Ten years. I started, you know, as a carry in the bag. Uh, they moved me to Valdosta. You know, I'm, I'm, you're, I'm sure you're familiar with Valdosta. That's a, the a rivalry with Tipton. 
Yeah. 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 So I was in Valdosta um, for a year, and my territory went from the Alabama state line to the ocean. Now, most people don't know this, but you do. Georgia is the largest landmass state east of the Mississippi. It's larger than New York, and it's larger than Florida. True I fact. don't know that. It's true. Look it up. Um, if, in the base of Georgia, you know, it like shifts out. So from side to side, it's a five and a half hour drive, six hours from north to south, and it's about five and a half from east to west. And I lived right in the middle in Valdosta. So I had to drive these little bitty towns. You had to learn how to plan really well. You had to get there, do your thing. God, that's got to be the worst. I'm, we used to drive from Columbia, South Carolina to Tifton. It's, it was seven hours. And it took so long because you had to go through all these little towns. It wasn't like yeah. there was the major 95 or whatever rotting right to the, the to to the. So you had for you, you have to go through one small town to go like and you hit it red lights. Yeah. Yeah. You, didn't, sounds, ha- you didn't have ways. You didn't. I mean, you just oh, you, yeah. you had a map. I, you know, you had an atlas and, you know. Uh, uh, and guys, Paul is about 87 years old for those <laughs> of you who don't know this. <laughs> No, I'm joking. He's probably only like 36. He just carries a <laughs> yeah, little silver. Yeah, there you go. Keep it going. Keep it going. So, okay, so you're doing this traveling. Are you enjoying what you're doing? For sure. Yeah. I mean, Married, I was, not married yet? Um, I got married about six months after I started with J&J. So we got married. She moved down to Valdosta. We were there for maybe another six months, and I got a phone call from my boss, and he said, they want to move you to Jacksonville. They think you. I was. I did. I won re, a region rookie of the year, Southeast region rookie of the year, which was a big deal. And um, they said, uh, he said they want to develop you, and you need a metro territory. So we're going to take all that stuff on the west side of the state. We're going to take some of the like Brunswick they took away from me, which I really enjoyed going to Brunswick St. Simon. So I had a lot of friends there, and I moved to Jacksonville. But I got you know. I, I had more OBGYNs in one building than I had in my entire territory when I lived in Valdosta. Really? Yeah. yeah, we were women's health care. So we sold birth control pills and vaginal therapeutics. And so I was there for a year. They put me in the developmental program. So the developmental program is where you get trained to train new people, and then you train new people, but you got to keep your market share up and you know juggle all the balls. And a year later, I got a phone call. And it was our region manager, and he said, you want to be a district manager? And I said, yes, sir. And he goes, we want you in Charlotte. And I was like, thank you, because a friend of mine had gotten promoted about two weeks earlier, and they sent him to Portland, Oregon. I didn't want to go to Portland. <clears throat> so I went to, uh, I went to Charlotte and became – I was 29 years old, and – how much were you now making? I'm a manager. How much? So what year roughly, and how much were you making? So I joined J and J in eighty, um, eighty eight, excuse me, and so that would have been you know, um, nineteen ninety, and I was probably making I don't know um, forty grand something. I mean, J and J paid you pretty well. Yeah, I mean, but that's a lot of money. For- yeah. It, when you're in your 20s and you don't have kids and all that kind of stuff. Right. No, it was it was good money and, you know, good benefit, really good benefit. Back then, holy mackerel, you know, the health care. J.J. had a program, too, that if you referred someone who got hired, you got stock. And I referred three people who got hired, so I got a bunch of stock. And then as you move through the management ranks, you hit a level of performance. There's more stock, and, and it, it, they, they treated you really nicely. They It was... It was a good company. Guys, you're listening to the Shrimp Tank Charleston Show. We're sitting here talking to Paul Sparrow, the managing partner of the Chief Outsiders. And, again, you can follow our show on Apple Podcasts. Under the search menu, just type in the Shrimp Tank Charleston. So I want to fast forward because we only have so much time to, to talk, and, and I, I want to fast forward and start talking about what the chief outsiders does because it's a very unique interesting company that brings tremendous value can help companies you know grow a tremendous amount give the kind of the quick commercial of the chief outsiders how it was why it was started what it does 
So um, Chief Outsiders, <clears throat> excuse me, Chief Outsiders was founded in 2009. Um, our principles, their vision was to bring together world-class marketers doing the best work of their careers. And that's what they've accomplished. Um, since 2009, when I joined the company, which was eight, eight and a half years ago, I was number 30. Today we have 130. And uh, over the last 10 years, we've been on the Inc. 5000 every year, 10 straight years. It's been a crazy growth curve. What, what is it that we do? We provide fractional, which is a fancy word for part-time, outsourced, uh, chief marketing officers. And in 2022, we added chief sales officers. So I mean, when you think of the revenue engine, Chief Outsiders is a, is a good resource to talk to. Um, the typical companies that we work with, uh, small, mid-sized businesses, if you um, do any business in the private equity world, which about 25% of our new clients come from private equity, uh, private equity refers to it as the lower mid market. So, um, companies that are about five million to two hundred fifty million in revenue. And if you think about it, it's a really smart model. I mean, the it, this fractional CFO model was really the very first outsourced executive. And uh, there's a company, a couple of companies that have been in business for probably thirty years. You know, so but nobody was doing the fractional CMO. We were the very first company to do it, and today we're the largest. So explain to the to the audience, when we talk about chief marketing officer, that can that can mean a lot of th things. I mean, some people could interpret that as that's, your, that's a sales guy, which in part ways I would think probably it is. But w what is y'all's definition of what a chief marketing officer is? Yeah, we split sales and marketing and uh, the fact of the matter is uh, you've got to have a really functional marketing engine to drive your sales um, a chief marketing officer is responsible for the strategy the growth strategy of the company and the execution of that growth strategy particularly as it relates to how they promote the the company if you think of it this way it's extremely important to understand the buyer's journey, okay? Because today, with all this information, digital and everything, your buyers are checking you out before they ever meet you. And so if you don't understand what the inflection points are in that buyer's journey, you're not going to influence them very well. Uh, a good CMO is going to have all the strategic chops to, to look at the data that's the most important thing. Start with information, not just uh, so a lot of businesses. The, mis the mistake they make is they go, we think we need to do a podcast. We think we need to do some sort of video stuff. Everybody's doing that. Let's do that. That'll get us attention. Okay. Maybe a, a good CMO will ask you why and what data points do you have that proves that doing that is going to have an influence on your audience, on your targets. And I know you're a big fan of the uh, the Bule brothers. Uh, Bolio. Uh, Bolio brothers. Uh, and these are, for those of you that, that they're kind of well-known economists that I know help, and you've shown me on this using the, the benchmarking and the, um, well, I, I'm losing my thought on, uh, the metric. Well, it's a metrics where you're really capturing more data. If you had to say, if you went to 10 companies random mm -hmm. that are 10 million in revenue, let's just say, how many of them do you think really are forecast looking ahead and using some type of system to know what, if they're about to go into a drought or recession or whatever? Uh, very, very few. Is two there, out of two out of ten, would you think? Maybe not even one out of ten. Most don't. Most don't. I, I talk to business. Look, as a managing partner with Chief Outsiders, my job is the care and feeding of thirty four executives across the South, and other people in the firm too, for that matter. And so I talk to business owners all day, every day. That's a huge part of of my job. 
most business owners, most CEOs, presidents of companies, if you say, how, how are you doing? How's your business doing? They have a sense of how they're doing. You know, it's like we were talking at your Vistage meeting, those, those four economic phases. Everybody kind of has a sense of which economic phase they're in. Don't always know for sure. Don't always have data to back it up. But, uh, you know, I've been running this business for 20 years, so I know where I am. What they don't know is where they're going, what direction they're heading in. And I would say out of 10 businesses, uh, nobody has the forecasting piece in place. There might be the ones that deal with numbers, accounting firms, they probably they probably have some sort of a lagging indicator that tells them what economic phase they're in. Which is sad, too, because it's such an obvious thing that you should, you know, that 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 would be like the Georgia Bulldogs knowing that they're going to play uh, Alabama in a week or two weeks and not really forecasting what potential the plays are going to be thrown at them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Which they would never do. No, no, I, I agree. I agree. It, but it's, you know, it's the way things go. I mean, look, businesses are entrepreneurial. So somebody starts a business because they've got a passion in their heart about a product or a service or, you know, who they're serving or what have you. And how do they get to the point of success Man, they do everything they can. Head bottle washer, bathroom scrubber, sales guy, you name it. They do everything that they can. Then there comes this point where you have proof of concept, you're you're profitable, you're growing. And then you have to cross the chasm. And that's the hardest part. And most business owners that are entrepreneurs are really not well equipped to cross that chasm. That's why, that's why we have a business. Because business owners who need help building the right strategy, the right growth strategy with a good marketing and sales engine driving that forward. More often than not, they, they've been involved in sales, but they typically will put more boots on the ground to drive sales. Let's get 10 more salespeople. There's a point where 10 more salespeople does not get the same return today that it did 10 years ago. And so you have to have the right strategic focus and the right strategic growth. Which point. is where the chief outsiders comes in and helps you build that. Yeah. All right, guys, uh, you're enjoying another great episode with Paul Sparrow of the Chief Outsiders, but we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Do you own a whole life or universal life insurance policy? Were you told to expect a big tax-free nest egg at retirement or the dividends will pay for the policy instead of you? Agents frequently sell products like this that are profitable for them, but not for you. Let Double E audit your policy at no cost. Call now to find out how Double E Insurance and Financial Solutions can help you. 843-936-6352. Double E LLC dot com. Securities offered through Fortune Financial Services, Inc. Member FINRA SIPC. Elkins Financial Double E LLC and Fortune Financial Services, Inc. are separate entities. Welcome back, guys, to the Shrimp Tank Charleston Show. I'm your host, Eric Elkins, as well as founder of Double E Insurance and Financial Solutions. I use the Shrimp Tank Charleston platform to continue elevating my life as well as our clients' lives. If you want to reach out to me or be a potential guest on the show, please go to our website, www.doubleellc.com, two E's in the middle, and go to the Contact Us page and reach out and see if uh, you could be the next Paul Sparrow from Chief Outsiders. All right, so... Paul, we were talking about how f- companies could leverage and build a strategy and work with a company like Chief Outsiders. And I feel like a lot of companies, one, don't know that Chief Outsiders, that that kind of organization exists. They, I do think the, there's more out there about the fractional CFO uh, than this fractional C, a CMO and the CSO. But this, to me, is just so much more instrumental for a company growth. Nothing against CFOs. It's just so powerful what you guys can do. So kind of paint a picture. Maybe give us a little case study of an organization that is doing well, but just not getting off the, you know, not getting to the, to the head, you know, the peak. 
and but they want to, and they think that they have this marketing person. It might be the owner, founder that thinks that they have what it takes, but deep down to really scale it, they could leverage a company like the Chief Outsider. So if they were to do that, what what would you guys give them the picture of what that looks like? What is it when you come in? Give me examples of what you guys would do. Yeah. <clears throat> we approach our client engagements in what we call three phases. Now, what I'm going to describe to you sounds like it's linear and they actually overlap. But for sake of simplicity, let's, let's think of it in a linear fashion. So the first is what we call insights or the knowledge phase. That's data centric. So the very first thing that we're going to ask for, even before we have a kickoff meeting, is we're going to send a list of data sets that we're looking for. Now, most of our clients are smaller businesses, so their eyes get real big. We don't have all these. It's okay. Whatever you have on this list, send it to your CMO or your CSO, okay? And that's to try and figure out what, are, what is the company good at and where are the gaps. And the data never lies. So... Uh, uh, a business owner who says, well, we don't use data, and so uh, I'm just going to tell you the answers to your data questions. No, if you don't use data, we can, we'll can we set up the data measurements, the key things that you need to be measuring so we can determine how good the company is at what they're doing. For example, uh, lifetime client v uh, value. Um, what is that? How long is the typical lifespan you know, of, of a customer? Um, where, where is your business coming from? You know, we sell widgets. We sell green widgets, brown widgets, and red widgets. Okay, who do you sell them to? Are these geographic pockets? Are these different industries, right? And then there are data sets that measure all of that sort of stuff. What, uh, what do your customers think of you? Uh, what do your lost prospects think of you? Do you ever, you ever take the time to ask a prospect who said, nope, I'm not going to do business with you guys? You ever try to figure out why? You know, it's so important to do, but I, th I think it's like a, it's it's like getting dumped by your by a girlfriend, <laughs> and you just don't want to. You, it, you don't want you, the pain. Yeah, you just don't want to feel that rejection, and then you hear so many people just say, "Well, they just don't know what they're doing." You know, they, it's, an, and you should find out. Yes, hundred percent. But the sad thing is, so many, so many of those previous clients wouldn't tell you the truth anyway. Maybe, maybe not. <clears throat> but the key is asking. The more data points you have, the better off you're going to be. So, how do we, how do we uh, conduct our engagements at Chief Outsiders? We start with insights. And what I just described is all internal to the four walls of the business, but then there's external insights. There's market-facing information and what's the competition doing and you know what's the economic health of the marketplace that you're operating in and a whole host of other things. Most small, mid-sized businesses have a decent handle on their internal metrics and not much on the external. And that's okay because, hey, we're a, a large B2B consulting firm. We have lots of resources so we can augment whatever they're missing. Or if we don't have it in our coffers and it's mission critical to understand, we can find it. Well, what I also think is cool about Chief Outsiders is the fact that if I'm in the financial sector or I'm in healthcare sector, you're placing a strategic CSO, CMO that has that experience in the financial industry. You're not putting a CMO that has never worked with a financial advisory firm or uh, a bank, whatever it might be. That's right. That's exactly right. And, you know, I, I sometimes get asked, particularly before the, the pandemic, I got asked this a lot, a little bit less since the pandemic. But so if I was talking to a prospect in Atlanta, it's how many, how many CMOs, do you, CMOs and CSOs do you have in Atlanta? And, you know, at that time we had three. Uh, okay. Um, well, I want my person to be here in Atlanta. Okay. You're a healthcare company. I have three really good CMOs in Atlanta. None of them are healthcare CMOs. That's, that's not an appropriate candidate for you. We want to see our CMO regularly. Okay. You might want to see your CMO regularly, but here's what you don't want to do. You, you want your money to go far. So you don't want to spend for 90 days teaching the uninitiated your business. 
and your marketplace. It doesn't make sense. You want someone, exactly to your point, Eric, you want someone who comes in with that market-based experience and understands your world and your pain and has actually examples of having worked for, if it's financial services, having worked with a financial services firm, or if it's a healthcare provider, having worked with healthcare providers or hospitals or doctors or whatever the situation may be. I'm always surprised, though, how people end up choosing certain group, depending on like, if I had, if I broke my leg, I don't go to a dermatologist. I wouldn't go into an orthopedist. <laughs> right. And at the, but what you see so a lot of times in business, people will go, Oh, Oh, you have a insurance license. Or I went to this guy cause he, he's, he's my state farm sales uh, guy. And he said he could sell me this huge, my estate planning stuff. No, that that's not even their core. Mm -hmm. But people uh, sometimes, I guess it's just easier. But then your your the results are so much worse. Yeah. Well, you know the world is uh, built on relationships, and I mean, sticking with my Atlanta example. There are a lot of, of fractional CMOs sprinkled around Atlanta. We call them single shingles. They're just a single guy or a gal who's, you know, decided that they don't want to work for a company anymore, so they rent themselves out in the same model as us. A lot of those are former Coca-Cola executives, and they're rock stars in the CPG world, but they got no business right. consulting a financial services organization or a healthcare company. That's not, that's not their sweet spot. And while they're probably really smart people, well-trained and know how to figure things out, why would I ask you as if you client to pay us for, and literally it's going to take at least 90 days to learn that. That doesn't, that's not a good, that's just not a good model. It doesn't meet your needs. What we put in is a, a CMO that you vet in the discovery process and, you know, there are three things that you're looking for. One is industry experience. Same is true with CSOs. Uh, industry experience. There are specific elements of your revenue engine that need to be addressed. So, for example, if you're looking for, let's say your uh, digital engine is broken. Well, you, you don't want a content and a branding expert. You want a digital. You want someone with digital expertise. So now it's financial services and digital. And then the third thing is the cultural fit. And that, that you figure out in the discovery process. I mean, there's a way, there's a certain kind of culture at your business. There's a certain kind of culture at my business. And, there, you know, there's the we connect and we don't connect. And you want all three of those boxes to Cause get you, checked. Because you're giving me multiple candidates. Well, you're, you're kind of narrowing it down. But then you're giving me the option to pick from these three CMOs. And then that helps me or whoever go okay, I feel like in my gut, this one, they all have the experience, but this one's going to be a better fit for us. All right, let me ask you a question, though. One of the things that would be, is always, is execution. You guys come up with this great CMO plan, mm -hmm. or ch ch this marketing plan, or sales process and plan. We paid you this money to help build this whole thing and to, and to get it, but I would, I would think how, how well is the execution when I hired you and then to sustain it? Hmm. Great question. Your question. I only ask your questions. Are good, questions. Brother. They're good. Um, let's go back to, uh, the three phases that I mentioned earlier about how we conduct an engagement. So we call those the growth gears. We went through the first one. That's insights. That's data. The second is the strategy, building the strategy. And the third is what you just asked. It's execution. Now, I'll tell you this in full disclosure. The first time that a friend of mine, a mentor of mine, said to me over lunch, you should be a consultant. This was about nine or ten years ago. I just done a four-year run with my second startup. I've, I've been at two startups. One you've heard of. One you've never heard of. One was WebMD. The other, it ended up getting sold for a nickel, but four years of bootstrapping and the founder didn't want to bring in investors and it was like, why am I getting paid a nickel for equity that's not worth anything? So I got to figure out what I'm going to do when I grow up. And my mentor said to me, you should be a consultant. And I wash your mouth out. No way. 
I, I'd hired many consultants in the course of my career. I can remember at J and J, one of the big three came in and dropped this big deck on my desk with an invoice for about 750k and said, "If you do that, you'll be successful." And I looked at the guy and I said, "I got a full time job. What are you doing?" And they weren't. There was no execution. It was here's what you need to do. Here's the book. Now you go read it and, and go execute. The it. difference between chief outsiders and that is execution. And that for me, when I met chief outsiders, that for me was the, was the tiebreaker that, and, and we have a really cool culture in our company for, we will not do a gig with a client. If they want us to just go in, build the strategy and then leave. That's no bueno. Okay. Why? Cause we need to make sure it gets executed. Now, if you have resources that can execute it, we'll sit in the co-pilot seat and just make sure they're flying the plane properly and that they know how to read the, the, the dials on the, you know, in the cockpit. I mean, everything's data driven. You know, you start with data, you end with data, you measure the outcomes. And if you don't measure the outcomes, that's where you end up going, I'm spending all this money on marketing and half of it's working. I don't know which half is working, you know, the, right. old, the old joke. Execution is mission critical. So we definitely execute what we put in place, but here's what we don't do. We don't hang around for five years sucking the marrow out of your bones because you're a small, mid-sized business. You, I mean, we, you're going to pay a premium for our services, but it's well worth it because we're going to make sure that you've got the talent, either internal, external, or a combination to fly that plane, to continue moving that, driving that engine forward. And we won't, we, you know, we, we will not finish the engagement until that's done and we scope that out ahead of time so it's not like an evergreen type of thing typical engagement with us is six months really yeah. i would have thought it was longer mm -mm, six months some you know sometimes there are three three ways that you can hire us uh, more often than not it is fractional occasionally it's it's project based so that digital example i gave you we just need our digital engine fixed okay we can help you fix the digital engine we need to make sure we're going to execute okay so there's there's that piece and then once in a while we're hired in an advisory capacity just coaching and mentoring and you know oversight but uh no real deliverables of any type, but more often than not, it's fractional. But the average, yeah, is six months, and it's about twenty-five to thirty percent of a CMO or a CSO's time. And you know, some some CEOs struggle a little bit with that. They're like, wait, but I've I've got a VP of sales, and I got a hundred percent of his time, mm -hmm. and he's doing all kinds of things that have nothing to do with driving your sales forward. He's doing 360 degree feedback sessions and HR planning and succession planning. And all. We're just flying your, your revenue plane. We're just, we're getting your revenue plane. Yeah. And properly. well, there's also the issue of just so, and, and I find this more in men than women that we, we brag that we work 14 hours. And then if we had truly a monitor camera on us, we really worked for like four. Yeah. <laughs> and women, work six to eight and really executed a ton of stuff over six to eight. Yeah. 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 But what, I'm pro women. Yeah. I'm pro women too. What, what you get, Matt, some of our very best uh, executives are, are female. Um, what you get with us, you're getting a world-class sales and or marketing executive. I mean, you, you can't even get an audience with us if you're interested in joining Chief Outsiders if you have not been head of sales or marketing at two or more large companies. <clears throat> and we like diversity. Like my background, you, you kind of ran through it. Fortune 50, um, emerging growth, turnaround, startups. I've also invested in, owned, and run my own business pretty diverse background so we're we're operational executives and we're the type of people that are in chief outsiders uh, a small mid-sized business is not going to hire that person they, they can't afford to hire them as their head of marketing or their, their head of sales but you can rent them for a short period of time and get that plane moving in the right direction and then teach people how to fly it and then parachute out and the plane will fly well, I, and I know, I mean, I know how, obviously the company has the right formula because one, you wouldn't continually be on the Inc. 5000 and have this double digit growth that you obviously have had since 2009. So, 
Uh, guys, you're listening to the Shrimp Tank Charleston. We're going to take our last break. We'll be right back. We're going to ask Paul some subscriber questions that we got and uh, kind of what the future looks like with chief outsiders in the future, but also Paul's future. We'll be right back. If you're like most successful business executives, you would probably rather stick your arm in a bucket of snakes than formulate a strategy for your insurance and financial needs. Who even understands estate planning, 401k plans, or key men insurance? We do. We are Double E, your virtual chief insurance and financial officer. Let us free you up to do more of what you do best and less of what we do better. Call 843-936-6352, double E L L C dot com. Securities offered through Fortune Financial Services, Inc., member FINRA SIPC. Elkins Financial, Double E LLC, and Fortune Financial Services, Inc. are separate entities. Guys, we're back. Shrimp Tank Charleston sitting here talking to Paul Sparrow of Chief Outsiders Group, which is a CMO, CSO company that you can take advantage of instead of trying to hire one of these gurus to come run and build your sales force or your marketing plan. You hire Chief Outsiders, and next thing you know, you'll be on the Inc. 5000, or hell, you could be on the on the Fortune 500 for potentially. you have any Fortune 500 companies as clients? We really don't work with that many enterprise. We, we, there are some exceptions, but most of our, our clients fall between about $5 million and $250 million in revenue. And is, is there a situation, if a company was, let's just say, not doing well, they, they, weren't, they weren't producing the numbers, maybe they're even at losses, they have, but they want to try to take and, and do something so that they don't keep having this trend, is, is that the perfect time to really bring you in? Yeah. I, I often say uh, when a company is growing well, things are good, and, and that's not the time to hire chief outsiders. I mean, you, you've got to have some pain. you got to be motivated to want to do something about the pain, and you got to want to invest to do something about that pain. That's a good time to have a conversation with us. I'll readily say, Eric, we are not the perfect fit for everybody out there. So we're not always the right solution, but it's my job to figure that out quickly and let them know if we are or if we aren't. But it really comes down to pain. And most often it's it's either growth pain or there's just some dysfunction in the revenue engine that needs to be diagnosed and fixed. And that's what we do. It, or do you have stats that based off of people that have hired you, <clears throat> on average, their company revenue was, you know, 10% higher within 12 months, 24 months. Do you have any of those kind of stats? Yeah, I don't have anything that I, to pull out of my, my hip pocket, but we've got a lot of case studies. Matter, matter if I can get our website and yeah, see you tons of them. Great website, by the way. <clears throat> thank you. Well, we're, you know, we're supposed to be uh, marketers, so it, it better be great, but thank you. Um, but anyway, we have a lot of case studies um, that w- with CEOs and, and uh, executives uh, basically saying, hey, here was the situation. We work with chief outsiders. You know, here's the outcome. I mean, we really do make a difference in our clients' lives. The whole reason to hire us is because you want to grow your business. You want to accelerate your growth. And you, you need to prepare, again, to cross that chasm. You need to build the infrastructure to scale. And that's what we do. Are you getting into dis- the discussion of acquisition in sure. That? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. So it's not just organic. It, it could be. It's a, it's a mix. Yeah. We, uh, one of the first questions I ask a, a CEO uh, when we have a, a, just an intro call is uh, their pers- a prospective client. I will say, "What's your vision for the company?" I, I won't box them in. I won't say, "What's your three year plan? What's your ten year plan?" Because everybody doesn't think in three year, ten year. What's your vision for the company? And you get all kinds of answers. Um, so I'm, we want to double, we want to do this, we want to do that. Okay, what do you, what's your plan to exit? And sometimes it's, we don't want to exit. I, I want Junior to run the business. Or other times it's, yeah, we want to get to the point where we're attracted to private equity. Okay, that's important to know. Now, 
we know private equity. Like I said, about a quarter of our new clients come in through the private equity channel. So we have relationships with a number of PE firms across the country and a, and a good reputation too. But yeah, being ready to take your business to the next level is super important. You have to have a vision. You know, I often talk to business owners and look, I'm a big networker. So I was just talking with a, an M&A broker uh, in Nashville the other day. And we were talking about how so many business owners will reach out to him and say, we're, I'm ready to sell. Help me get, help me sell and get us a private equity firm, get us dressed up and let's go do the tour. And he takes a look at under the covers and goes, there's no way that we can approach private equity right now. There, you know, we got to do this. We got to do this. We got to do this. Cause there are certain things you got to have in place to be attractive to private equity. But if you plan to do those things, you'll get a nice multiple. Again, I mean, a lot of this stuff is just so obvious, but we don't, and we dream. It's easy for people to go, yeah, I want the company to be a hundred million dollars in the, and that's what my goal is to have it. Uh, but they don't really have, they don't have the, the map on how they're even going to go there. Mm-hmm. And, or they don't want to go there because they're afraid to go there. Mm-hmm. What is, what do you mean? I, that means you're going to have to acquire. That means you're going to have to hire 70 more people. And then they're like, Oh, I don't know if I want to do all that, <laughs> which is where you hopefully say, no, we're going to help you do it. Take a lot of that load off. All right. Let me, I got some questions. Then we're going to wrap up from some subscribers. So the first one is kind of near your world where you grew up. Frank in Columbus, Georgia. I have an IT services company with 25 employees. We have averaged about 4% growth per year over the last four years. I want to enhance that, but not sure where I should focus. How would your company help me? Uh, that's a really good question from Frank. Um, do you know Frank? No, I don't know Frank, but it's a good question. Just the same. It, that, that's a hard question to answer. And let me tell you why, because I don't know enough about Frank's business. Okay. He's grown 4% year over year for X number of years. Okay. Where's the growth come from? What does your growth look like compared to your competition? What does the growth look like compared to the industry? Some some businesses, 4% growth is great. Others, oh my goodness, only 4%, right? I, 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 don't, I need a frame of reference. That's why insights, knowledge, data, that first gear is so incredibly important. But the starting point, if Frank were on the line with us here, I would say, Frank, let's have a sidebar conversation. I got a handful, 45 minutes. I got a handful of questions to ask you about your business, and I can help you figure out just some simple things that you can do strategically to move things forward. How so? F- to that point, how how can Frank how can Frank get a hold of you? What's the best way to contact or reach out to the chief outsiders? You can reach me on email p sparrow at chiefoutsiders dot com. P as in Paul Sparrow, just like the bird or Captain Jack, if that makes you laugh. P sparrow at chiefoutsiders dot com. All right, so Frank, just just take the leap of faith. And say that the shrimp tank Charleston sent you. If these folks, if if your business becomes a Fortune 500 company because of the podcast on the shrimp tank Charleston today, what are you are going to offer the shrimp tank folks when they call and say the shrimp tank Charleston sent me? Are you giving them any kind of discount or just the opportunity to, that you get to talk to Paul Sparrow? Uh, there's certainly goodwill going into that, so I'll take it into account. All right, so just mention the Shrimp Tank Charleston sent you, Frank, and whoever else, if you want to reach out. These guys are a very strong company. I'm, I, I've been familiar with them for the last three years, and it's an incredible ride they've been on. All right, second question. Chris from Wichita, Kansas. What is the number one reason you think Chief Outsiders has had such tremendous growth? Wow, that's a great question from Chris in Wichita. And I've never been to Wichita, <clears throat> but I did get stuck in Oklahoma City recently because of bad weather in Dallas, but that's a different story. Um, what is the reason why we have had such tremendous growth? A, uh, we have met a market need. And, it, boy, it's always good to have a company that's novel and different and has a strong value proposition. You're the first one to do it your chances of growth are, are pretty dadgum good. The other piece is because I, I mentioned our culture earlier. I didn't really spend a lot of time on that. 
We have been uh, madmen and women about retaining our culture. Our culture is collegial, it's collaborative, it's familial. I'll give you an example. If you said to me, Paul, I need a, um, I need a resource that uh, will help me uh, uh, map out uh, business planning. Just uh, do you have like a, uh, some templates, business planning templates? I can literally go onto our company Slack channel right now, put the request out, and in 30 minutes I'll have five or ten responses and with attachments. It, I mean, I, I get to tap in. We call our, our company the tribe. I get to tap in to the power of the tribe. So the other reason why we've grown is we've, we only hire world-class sales and marketing executives, and we screen for culture. So that our people are our resource. That, well, give me that, an example when you say you screen for culture. What's, what do you do? What's an example of how you're leveraging that? Um. As I'm interviewing executives that are interested in coming to Chief Outsiders, I, I'm asking them for examples of how they've been successful in their career. And if it's me, 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 uh, that's typically a, a, a yellow flag. Hmm, okay. When, when have you ever accomplished anything driving a business as me, me, me? Right? It's, all, it's, a, it's a team sort of thing. We're looking for people that uh, work well with others. And that's important, not just in our company, but it's important with our clients. Think of it. it. It's a clever name, chief outsiders. We're outsiders. And our job is to come into that business, which by the way, has its own unique culture, integrate into that culture. Well, communicate with that CEO effectively, that executive team, that marketing manager or that sales director that's threatened to death that we've showed up because they think their job's in jeopardy. And it's our job to integrate with them, get to know them quickly, and work with them in a collaborative, collegial way. And that's something that we're extremely good at. So that that's a kind of our secret sauce. And, um, you, it, know. you know, it always comes back, oh, this culture is such a powerful point. You know, it's amazing when you have companies that got super successful and had such a toxic culture too. Mm. Both extremes to me sometimes are just mind boggling. But the toxic culture is not it's not scalable. That company will hit a hit a they'll hit a wall at some point. Now they might be able to recover, but the toxicity I mean, you can't hold on to good people. You you just can't. And they don't think it's their fault. They just think it was your fault. Yeah. Well, good luck with that. Yeah. Uh, well, we'll look at the data and see how effective they were. Hired the chief outsiders. They'll show you. It's you, <laughs> boss. All right. Gail in Cincinnati, Ohio. I own a 40, 40 employee company that distributes capacitors and semiconductors. I'm concerned about the future economy. How would your company help me navigate through making strategic decisions? And now that that's a <clears throat> that's a tailor made question there because <clears throat> excuse me that's a tailor made question and you know it because uh, I, I do a workshop on that very topic. Um, the I, I will say this: you mentioned the bolios earlier, Eric, and uh, as you know, Chief Outsiders, we're big fans of uh, the bolios and their company, ITR Economics, and in full disclosure, they've been a client of ours as well. Um, they're very good at forecasting the U.S. economy and the global economy, for that matter. Um, Twelve months out, they are almost 95% effective in doing that since the early 80s, 94.7%. So uh, we recommend ITR's monthly insights data. They are saying that we're going to exit 2024 in a recession. It's going to be a choppy year. Um, it's not going to be a brutal recession. It's not going to be like 08, 09, um, that a really tough recession that we had, but it's going to be tough just the same. So you, it, what do you, what are you going to, how, how do you navigate through that? You need to understand what's coming external to your business, but let's go back to that question you asked me earlier. You also need to understand 
How economically sound is our business? Where are we in the growth curve and what direction are we going in? And when you couple that, those two pieces of information together, you can build a really good strategic plan. An example of that would be if your business is in a growth mode and the markets that you compete in are in a recession, there you have some real opportunities for some aggressive strategies to take advantage of that recession and to take advantage of that growth. Whereas if that was flipped, if your business was in a recession and the market was in a growth mode, well, you can't be as aggressive. You, you just can't. You have, to, you have to be more conservative. But if you know that, knowledge is power. So if you have that information, you can build the right growth strategy, and that's what we help our clients do. Which, again, goes back to, one, what, what position is your company in? And what is it potentially going to, where is it looking like it's going? But then if you are selling semiconductors, if you're not keeping track of here's where the trends showing for the semiconductor business or the capacitor business is, is forecasting to be, if you don't know that, it's, it's just, again, it's such important data to yeah. be aware of. Yeah. Yeah. There's, you know, there's the other piece too. So if you're a manufacturing company, you source different goods, maybe from different parts of the world. You know, if you're, if you need steel to manufacture your product, you need to have a good sense of the, the price of steel and the direction that market is going in. Cause if the market is growing, you might want to buy more steel now than in six months. Right. Wouldn't that make sense? And if the market is heading down, you might negotiate your contracts differently. That information is super powerful. Uh, you know what's hard in my business is, like in the insurance business, it's an intangible mm -hmm. thing. So it's not like I have lead times and concerns there, which is a great thing. And I don't have to carry inventory and all that kind of stuff. But it's also difficult, not that you, I, I'm not trying to – say I can't get data, but it's also hard to know is, is that insurance solution that you're selling, is that g going away or is it going to slow down? Cause again, it all kind of comes back to the consumer environment of what is going on overall for overall consumers. So it's just, it's, it's hard. It's hard to run a business at the end of the day. And again, and I'm not even getting paid to promote the chief outsiders, just so you guys know. So <laughs> this is, uh, they, they did not pay me to come on the show. I should have charged you. I mean, because I, I am giving you guys some great endorsements, but you deserve it. You really do. It's a great company. Paul's a great guy, very knowledgeable guy, easy guy to talk to, too. So if you have interest, again, reach out to Paul. If you want to talk to Paul and get more insight about the company, you can reach out to him via email. That's P Sparrow. Sparrow. Sparrow, sorry. S P A R R O W at chiefoutsiders.com. Correct? Correct. All right. And anything else you want to share with us before we sh shut this thing down? Uh, I really enjoyed myself. Uh, thank you for inviting me. It's been a lot of fun. Good, good. You'll go up on the Hall of Fame over here. Nice. The, the Wall of Fame, nice. I should say. Nice. The Wall. Guys, great show today. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Please check out our previous episodes on the various podcast, podcast channels and follow the show. Be a subscriber. If you are a visual person, then watch the interviews on the YouTube channel, which is the Shrimp Tank Charleston uh, channel. I would love to connect with my listeners, so please follow us on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, I guess X, which formerly known as Twitter. Just search Eric Elkins, E-R-I-C. I don't use a K. K is not cool. C is the way to go. Eric Elkins or type in double E-L-L-C or the Shrimp Tank Charleston. We have all kinds of stuff that you can be uh, following. If you or your company would like to have an enjoyable conversation about retirement, company employee benefits, life and long-term care insurance. It's an exhilarating product. Just to name a few, then contact Double E Insurance and Financial Solutions. Website is www.doubleeollc.com 
or email us at service at double e l l c dot com. All spelled out the word double e, two e's in the middle. Lastly, if you think you or you know of someone that is an entrepreneur or leader like a Paul Sp- Sparrow, sorry, I don't know why I'm struggling with that, making an impact in this world that would be a great guest, then please contact our producer, Kristen Kilman at kk at com. I'm Eric Elkins, and focus on being a one percenter. Paul, you know what a one percenter is? I guess the very best, cream of the crop. It's someone that does what 99% of people won't do. Chief Outsiders is a one percenter company. All right, guys, thank you so much. Tune in. More episodes coming. Welcome to the Shrimp Tank Charleston Show. I'm your host, Eric Elkins. But in real life, I'm an entrepreneur and founder of Double E Insurance and Financial Solutions. Double E helps individuals and companies navigate through their financial insurance portfolios. Double E provides clients an entertaining and unique experience. The Shrimp Tank Charleston Show allows us the opportunity to interview and learn from the brightest entrepreneurs and leaders around. We dive into their journey and discover what drove them to become so successful. We will make sure we get out of them not only the wins, but also the losses that they have had on their journey. We are a nationally syndicated podcast that can be heard and watched on YouTube, Google, Apple, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. You can also tune in and subscribe to our shows on our website, shrimptankpodcast.com slash Charleston, or check us out on the Double E website, doubleellc.com.